Thank you very much, everyone. This is our fourth week um, now here on Liberating Cinema Film Series for 2021. And I'm glad, thank you for everyone who joined tonight. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about Memories of Scotland post-war documentary. And for me, it's an interesting subject and I'll clarify kind of next. I'll do a little bit of an introduction and then we'll really get into it. And then if you have questions, uh, we can leave them for the end. But I think basically, so why are we talking about post-war documentary? For me, well, first of all, I'll say a bit, bit more about kind of British film culture and kind of why I, we're choosing specifically to focus on this period. Um, and then I'll kind of go also more into specifics of Scotland, Scottish film culture, Scottish movie making, um, and the Amateur Film Association that was made um, here in Scotland. So, and also the Scottish archives, I should say. So first of all, part of the reason I really think it's important to look at documentary um, form and is because, well, in the case of Britain, there's quite a rich documentary tradition starting from, you know, we have John Grierson in the pre-war period and a an measurable number of pioneers um, that do really good work from the war and through throughout the war. Um, and often a lot of their work is also connected very much to information films, even propaganda. Um, and some films which came, you know, well, when looking back at them, we can really see that films are also, which are ideological, but some which are also experimental. So there's quite a range of films being made in the pre-war period. And then this continues in the post-war, you know, we have free cinema movement, which if you have time to, to, to kind of go into this more, it's a fascinating kind of movement that appears in the 50s, Filmmakers like Lindsay Anderson had their first appearance through free cinema. Um, and then we kind of have the full swing of, you know, British New Wave in the 60s. But there's this period um, in kind of the immediate post-war context and documentary filmmaking um, and especially amateur filmmaking that's often ignored. Um, that's often, you know, in the context of wider kind of writing a film history that's often unnoticed. But it's, that I think is essential for understanding film culture and film history in the context of Scotland, but Britain more widely too. Now, why to focus on Scotland? Now, there is several reasons. One, for me, a very interesting one, is to unpack several layers about the film we chose today, uh, Little Great Heart by Frank M. Marshall from 1949. First of all, it's interesting to look at uh, the film culture that arose in Scotland, specifically uh, through the festival, such as the Scottish Amateur Film Festival, which was already operating in Glasgow by 1933. And it was one of the basically one of the most unique and perhaps the first competition of its kind to be organized in the world and the first of the three major amateur competitions in the UK. The other two being, and this all you can read about more of this if you're interested in National Library of Scotland, there's uh, two others, which is the Institute of Amateur Cinematographers and Amateur Cineworld. But this one in Scotland worked well before the uh, Second World War and continued well into the 80s. Actually, the society uh, that organized this festival still still operates. It was actually organized by the Scottish Association of Amateur Cinematographers from 1949. There today, they still exist and they're the Scottish Association of Movie Makers. They've been renamed this. But basically they, they ran this as an annual event, um, both up until the eighties, at which point it was, um, I think around then that's when it stopped, but it had an incredible history. And some of the people that came to also mentor and this association were John Grierson, Hitchcock, Powell, Paul Rotha, um, and other important documentary and also feature filmmakers. Um, and they and one of the reasons basically why I what's really important to look at tonight is how first looking at memories of Scotland, but also how film culture formed in Scotland, blossomed in Scotland, what were moving movie film habits, but also filmmaking habits, um, and how they happened also in these grassroots levels that aren't often uh, seen um, in the bigger writing of film history, especially when we focus on fiction. So three things, if we can say there are three things we'll look at, and is to look at film directors, those film directors that were so important for documentary filmmaking, for Scottish filmmaking here. Um, and one of them is Frank M. Marshall, who I'll talk more about tonight. And the other is um, to talk about film festivals, the role of film festivals and supporting film culture, the role of film festival in exposing amateur filmmakers, um, and also connecting them with bigger industry um, and creating innovative new means of expression through film. Um, and so looking at really the kind of film culture that existed in, and it pertains to Scotland, um, and then also looking at, um, finally, faith in film, to see the role kind of faith played. Because, and I think, Janet, um, I need to find for you that really the person who wrote a lot about this, it was Janet McBain, and I encourage you kind of, if you have time to look at the kind of work held by the National Library of Scotland Moving, Moving Image Archive. Um, and Janet McBain herself um, did quite a bit of work 
talking about the films that were made and, you know, shot in Scotland. And what's interesting is that unlike in Ireland, she compares, where amateur filmmakers were often priests, in Scotland, they were often industrialists. So it's very interesting to see how faith as a subject, which is something, you know, and, and this is also in the case of the Scottish Archive, which doesn't appear so much or doesn't seem to appear so much, certainly plays an important role um, in, in, the, in kind of the, in the film history and also the, the, in the film history here. And to see, look at a film like Little Great Heart, that's such a profound example, you know, faith on the film, um, and that's t- and that's very actually simple as well, but nonetheless very beautiful. And to also see that despite this claim by people like McBain that filmmakers who were making films about faith weren't so prominent, a person like Frank M. Marshall, although he shot a variety of kind of films, which I'll talk about later, um, he also had had several films in which he expressed his faith which he talked about faith and some which had really some, um, yeah, some of some very beautiful works um, and testaments about faith. So, and it's interesting in that sense that it's not just about that films were made, you know, based on a subject basis, based on what somebody ordered, because we had also associations um, that were working in Scotland, which include, I think, is the Scotch, uh, Scottish Catholic, um, so Scottish Catholic Film Association from the 40s and 50s. Um, I'll find a bit more about, I'll talk a bit, a little bit about, about that later, but it's not just through the work of these associations that were specifically faith-based or church-based organizations, but it's also through the, um, the intention of directors themselves that we have um, professions of faith in film and here in Scotland. So now to actually get into the film we have tonight, which I, I hope we got a chance to see, and if you don't, it's very beautiful. It's only 37 minutes, but it's an astounding piece of work. So it's basically, it's a little great heart it follows, I, I, I can kind of basically give you a rough, if I, if I can, outline of the film and then why it's really, you know, why we're looking at it, why I kind of selected it as kind of representative of this period. And I think what for me is really interesting, first, of what it's about, it's a very human drama. It's about 10-year-old Morag who comes to live in Glasgow with her uncle and aunt. Um, and as she's tormented by the sons of a taxi driver, she eventually saves their life in a fire. There's a big twist of events. And eventually the boys realize the errors of their ways they become Christian and the two families become friends. Now, what's interesting, this sounds very simple and a very straightforward narrative. What's interesting is how this is done and how these transitions between the countryside, the village and the city, the home and kind of the urban landscape are kind of transposed and also the ideas of what, where, where home is not, um, but also the, the, the whole concept of how basically the di- dynamic beauty of everyday life is shown through the film. Um, and in the way we have, rather than talking about exposition, you know, or any kind of sense of narrative exposition, because again, this is another thing we should say, the film is silent, although it's made in the 40s, it has no sound. Um, so we are actually able to, without sound, although it seems, it may seem like a, something that inhibits or prevents the film, you know, from, especially in this period, from realizing its full potential. On the contrary, it's actually, it allows us to focus. We see human ge- dre- gestures street scenes, we focus on natural details. And now if I can kind of break it down, why again, perhaps the three parts work well, um, as for the introduction, also for the main part. Um, the idea why I wanted to look at Memories of Scotland is I think this film works, the entire kind of fabric of the film functions like a memory. We often have motifs of parcels, letters, calendars, um, of dates, postcards, of faded through people, especially people looking at their pictures of their whether it's families looking at each other's pictures or pictures of children, um, we often have this idea of memory coming through and literally fading on top of one another. So we often have, you know, vintage photographs uh, together with people's faces or memories of their home. Um, And then this contrast, you know, between city and country life comes in um, and that idea of where the true home is. So that's, and, but nonetheless, having said that, there is a beauty to the city as well. It provides, there's a great kind of, I think we, when we watch the film that we really experience the freedom in the countryside um, and, and kind of next to the waters and kind of in the, in the great outdoors, as it were. But there is also a great kind of joy in the city as we see the well, women going out for their day um, stroll, as we see the children moving and we see kind of people's face, faces and we see different characters coming. We see details. We see like drivers um, and we see like the buses moving, the traffic moving along Princess Street, which is my favorite shot. Like, you know, you see Princess Street in the fort. 40s, and although Edinburgh doesn't change much, as you know, the city is very old, nonetheless, the, there is significant change, and that's even seen by one shot. 
So, and I think that idea of memory, as well as to kind of these visual motifs, there's also kind of a underrunning motif in terms of just the color the film uses. There's a beauty, beautiful emphasis on color, which is really brought out by the 60 millimeter shooting. And this is one of the advantages of kind of the amateur movie making, as it were, because it there's this grainy feel, earthy feel that makes it really feel um, as a documentary. Now, and uh, particularly oranges, greens, the double deckers, the red, white color of buildings, the traffic passing down Princess Street, as I said. Now that brings out the beauty, but I think this color it plays a, an important role in conveying the emotion um, of the characters and their dy inner dynamics, but also the texture of the film. But there is also, uh, now moving to the idea of documentary as well, technically, you know, in, in terms of this film is shot like a fiction. It's a relationship between a family. But the way it's shot, you know, it's mode, it very much works as a documentary. As I had mentioned, a lot of these details of everyday life, this kind of pedestrian details, these countryside details, this focus on um, people's feet, their, their kind of gestures, um, and also on the objects, um, and basically this kind of enhanced by this really aesthetic of the 16 millimeter, um, that seems spontaneous, free moving. The camera work often, you know, is, focuses on some extra details we often focalized through characters that had nothing to do with the, you know, pre prevailing narrative. Um, so this kind of really, uh, basically, we can reclaim the film as a documentary. It kind of can re really focalize as a, as a documentary. And I think one of the particularly poetic details of the film is the idea of the dog and how the dog works in the film. Obviously, we have the Great Friars Bobby will go at the beginning, but then the first shot we see is, you know, the dog and the cow. And I think, and then later, the kind of the role the dog plays in saving the girl from the fire. It's very, quite beautiful, but in the way the kind of dog wor walks through shots and, you know, when the violence is happening, even those side shots of the dog walking past, um, it's, the film really captures those details, you know, in the background often, um, but that are crucial, you know, to what's going on in the foreground. So there's a great kind of uh, sensitivity to film language in this film um, and the kind of motif of the dog and the, the way um, the dog plays a kind of rescuer role. And actually like Ray Friars Bobby as well, that really comes out in the film without being overemphasized, without being too dramatic. It comes out quite nicely. Um, and it's actually important, I think, in this context to consider kind of the work of Frank M. Marshall um, as, a, as a filmmaker, because he was somebody who himself, um, he was born in 1896, actually, nicely works with the, you know, the birth of film. Um, and he lived to 1979 in Renfrewshire. He developed basically an interest in photography and film as a schoolboy. <clears throat> and he continued to make basically a lot of family films. Um, and even included his sons and his son and daughter and his grandchildren as actors. Um, but he was really an all man industry. And in that sense, it's, it's astounding. He directed, produced, edited, shot, and even acted in his own films. Um, and they often have his own, you know, sense for humor, um, his kind of sense for detail, as I said. And this is, I think, nicely captured. We've talked about the dog, but also through other details, um, like the animals that play a role, you know, in relation to the, to the other, to the people in the film. So there is, and he also, but he also did do work, basically, he did a, quite a few films, uh, over 120 actually, films in different a variety of genres. He did some films and even uh, treating uh, women for war work. Again, this, all you can see about this in National Library of Scotland Moving Image Archive and how to treat burns injuries. So that's, that all really, his films moved from films like Travel Logs around the Isle of Arran to basically, these, these kind of films about faith, like this one, Little Great Heart, through everyday exchanges, through family portraits, um, to different kinds of films on across moving across Scotland and also um, even instructional films like the Blood Transfusion Service. There's a film called The Life Saving Bank, um, for example. But basically, and he, he also focused kind of, he also had natural documentaries or films that, you know, focused on animals or seasides or geography. So he's really an interesting filmmaker. Um, and basically you can watch most of this, actually not most, let's say half, about half of these films you can watch through National Library of Scotland online even. So if you have time, I'd really encourage you to do this. He was also elected basically the first chairman, of what I mentioned earlier, of the Scottish Association of Amateur Cinematographers. Um, and he continued making films well throughout his life. So, and I think as a filmmaker, he's fascinating in the sense I will say first kind of more like broadly, but then also this brings me to the third point about faith, but he's fascinated as a filmmaker because he's able to capture these intimate details of everyday life. Um, and although films that are deemed or titled amateur, when they watch these historical films, you know, today we have a different idea of what amateur film means. Today we think because we have access to digital media, anybody can pick up a camera and make all kinds of films. 
back over 80 years ago, being an amateur filmmaker was quite different. It was quite, I imagine, difficult and also not, um, uh, perhaps it wasn't seen as quite practical because often if you wanted to make films and survive making them, how would you do it? You know, you had to um, go with the institutional way or, you know, make kind of feature films or perhaps well-backed documentary films, but find to find a way. So it's really an anomaly to have this, you know, an incredible body of work of somebody as an, as an you know, amateur filmmaker and then a, quite a serious filmmaker, but who started in this way and who supported, you know, through this organization that was based in Scotland well from 1933 onwards. Now, the, in terms of his, what he did, though, is I've said before, his films talked about faith and some of them, not all of them. I'm not saying this is kind of the only thing he is focused on, but this also comes out, I think, in the way he sees the world. So, and we have this beauty, um, basically, that comes out in Little Great Heart, the main motif, and I think that's the kind of one we should focus on if we, given our time, um, is the shot of the fire and, and the Christ figure appearing in the fire to the little girl. Now, this is a very, you know, noticeable shot. It shows up at some point in the film when the girl is, you know, in, initially at the, near the beginning, um, and it shows up there, and it's quite, you know, we don't have much context, we just see it, and, and yes, yeah, although there are other passages, you know, where we have quotes from the Bible, which are um, very moving and often very timely to what's going on in the film, the shot, nonetheless, you know, we don't understand its full significance until we watch the whole film. And then, so what do we have? We have a girl who's bullied, who's, you know, um, done, who, who doesn't, who doesn't have exactly the best relationship with these boys, not on her own part, but who, these boys who are very unkind towards her and who are very violent as well, you know. Um, and some of these scenes are quite startling as well. There's a dark shot of the boys in an alleyway coming out. So it's very, almost disturbing, you know, but although they are children. Um, but nonetheless, the film shows us at the end, when the boys are in trouble, she helps them. It's the spirit of a child. She helps them, doesn't think twice, um, and saves them from the fire. Um, and then we have this sudden shift back to the countryside, no explanation whatsoever, you know, and I really like this because there's no kind of um, uh, pretense and there's no sense of, you know, um, uh, melodrama or emphasis or, you know, actually even like, you know, missionarism or, uh, or evangelicalism in the sense that, you know, it's saying, oh, this happens, this happens and so on. No, we just simply see a shift back to the home country and now we see the boys there and we see them also on the sea and we see them um, now meeting basically the two families meet and they're together and they spend a day together and it's a very quiet and beautiful way of seeing the reconciliation between the families but also between the boys and the girl and then at the end we again see the girl looking into the fire and this time she sees through the shots of the fire we see christ again appearing in the flame holding the lamps and now what's particularly for me i think interesting in that way is that we see this embrace of love um symbolized through the fire in christ but then we also see as the shots appears this kind of um changing of significance so we see it initially uh which may symbolize you know her faith christ being with her but then when we see that we see what she goes through we see the trials she has we see even see how she's tried by fire in a way if we want to say that um and basically through these boys but that friendship uh, nonetheless prevails and that there is no that this idea the Christian um, approach of how that there is no such, well, you know, love your enemies. There is no such thing as an enemy. There is no boundary. And they're all together in the heart. So it's a very beautiful kind of contrast of what's in the heart and then that being manifest on the, on the outside too. The girl having that, being warmed around the fire of Christ, and then the boys coming together too. So there's a very beautiful kind of um, way of kind of the way the circle is kind of um, brought together and the way they're both embraced. And the way the boys, although she's quite, you know, um, are quite unkind at the beginning, the way they reconcile um, with her totally. And I think it's a very nice thing because the film also doesn't show us that, again, it doesn't do it in any pretentious way. There are previous scenes where we even see kind of um, subtle exchanges. And this is another poetic thing about the film uh, where we see subtle exchanges between the girl and the boys in the streets. They don't actually see each other, but we see her looking kind of with some compassion at him, him looking, you know, although he's kind of full of... Um, passion and you know something there's something that um, disturbs him nonetheless you can see he's you know good deep down that's the kind of idea we get we see a very unruly child but not one necessarily that's um totally you know out of out, out of bounds so um and that kind of when that's brought together at the end the film kind of reaches a meaningful hole but the way this is done is primarily through film language and primarily through this kind of um very unusual kind of uh, an eclectic and unexpected um, tapestry of shots that come together.
and they emphasize the different aspects of everyday life and their work through and where this relationship, which although it's initially it seems like a background, it becomes a prevailing narrative, and then it comes together at the end. But I think this is uh, what's most fascinating about the film, and perhaps also you know a special or exceptional about the film, if we take in context that perhaps not so many faith films were made um, in quite the same sense. Uh, it's a particularly special moment, I think. Um, this period in the 1940s in film history and for Scotland. So it's this idea of memory of uh, memories of Scotland in that sense um, should perhaps, at least for me, I can say what it means for me. I hope it also means something for you, um, but it's bringing us back uh, to the past to see what we can learn, um, to rediscover ourselves um, and, to, and to rediscover what, what we lost or what we may think we have lost, but what's always been there. So I hope... I hope you enjoyed the film and I hope, I mean, I hope you have some questions. There's quite a, this is quite a big subject. Um, but yes, basically I think it's a, it's a good subject to open with and um, to see how faith can be mediated um, and mediated and examined through film um, and perhaps trans and perhaps in transformative ways. I'll finish by saying basically, I hope that this, that uh, what we've spoken about tonight has helped in terms of kind of opening up another chapter in film history that we can, uh, you know, go discover more from um, and to discover really kind of the film culture that exi existed and exists in Scotland um, and the kind of filmmakers um, that played such an important role in documenting, you know, everyday life, um, that how, how people lived, how they related to one another and the faith they had. And, that's, and with the hope that that will inspire us in, in our own work and in our own life. So I hope you enjoyed the film, and I I, I, ser I certainly encourage you to watch more of both of Frank Marshall's films, which you can find all on through the National Library of Scotland, um, and also uh, the other films that are available through there, because there's really a big connection, big collection of documentary works, um, and on all kinds of aspects of life in Scotland and beyond. So, and I and I have to thank also the National Library of Scotland Moving Image Archive for the hell generous help they gave they gave us for showing this film, um, and for being so kind and supporting liberating cinema. Thank you very much.